This evening, uh, topic this evening, a uh, quick point, the next one is 4th of March, Alive, 5th of March, which is in Cape Town, where you obviously don't live, but it is Anthony Clark on his uh, small and big cap pick. Um, and in fact, he, so he has five of his absolute preferred, and he touches on another 10 or 12 stocks, um, which are sort of his second tiers. Uh, always great value for money. Um, you're obviously not in Cape Town, you can catch the, the live webcast, or the video is on just one lap, typically within a, let's say, two days, because I have to get back to Johannesburg and process it and everything. This evening, rise of momentum. So momentum is something which... I was for a long time sort of cognizant of, not cognizant of, I, I was trading, I was investing with momentum, but I hadn't fully comprehended either what it was or the fact that it existed, and I think more importantly, just how powerful momentum really is. And if we, oh, there's going to be a ton of legal stuff, but more importantly, my doofa doesn't work. And I need to plug it in. That's right. Oh, come on, Earth to Apple. Now my default works. Tons of legal stuff. Broadly, Momentum says that winners carry on winning long after we can't believe, and that losers carry on losing long after we say how low can we go. And, and an immediate example springs to mind in the case of African Bank. 40 Rand, everyone loved it. 30 Rand, everyone said buy 10 times more. 20 Rand, they said it can't go any lower. 10 Rand, they said it was an absolute guarantee. And when it gets to 1 Rand 20, they're going to say, you know what, sell the mother-in-law, the kids, go buy more. Point is, African Bank, to my mind, their business model, they've been legislated out of business, they're going to zero. But as human beings, we very much, we, we, we can't believe how far things can go. We can't comprehend. We always... You know, you, you buy a share and it goes up 15% and you think, yo, 15%, that's brilliant. Free money, but it's only warming up. Now you bought Capitec at a Rand 12 years ago and it went to two Rand and you thought you were a rocket scientist. You were. But if you sold a two Rand, you've missed out on the next 198 Rand of upside. That excludes dividends and everything else in that process. So it really is about that losers keep losing and winners keep winning. And I'm going I'm to cover this from a couple of different points. Partly because this is about human psychology. This is about human emotion. And there's two sides to it. One, what drives it. And two, our complete disbelief. And you look at it and say this is just absolute insanity. So there's two broad angles which fit into it. In essence, we all know the, you know, the theory of markets is buy low, sell high. And I'm not here to say that other methodologies are bad. I'm not here to say that momentum is the best out there. I'm saying that there are many different ways to engage the market. And the buy low, so high, sure. Of course, the question is, what the heck is low and what the heck is high? You know, was ABLE low at 20? Well, no. Is it now low at 10? I'll get back to you on that. In a year's time, I can tell you if 10 was low or not. And that is, of course, of zero use to you. But that's the honest answer. I don't know. I have a view. I don't know that for certainty. So it's about momentum says, you know what, buy high, so higher. And that's completely counterintuitive to what we're trying to do. What are we trying to do? We're trying to find the deal. You don't walk into the local BMW dealership and say, that BMW there? No, no, I want to pay more for it. You walk into the dealership and ask for a discount. Oh, well, we don't get one, but we ask for it. We're trying to get that, 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 that yeah, buy low, so high mentality. It's ingrained into us. You know, I, I and it, it's not a case where folks will say, ah, it depends. You know, my 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 grandfather was one of those folks who would you know save the pennies and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, and 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 put them all together and say, oh look, I, and we're talking here in the 40s and 50s when it was pennies and farthings and other such things. And you know, I saved myself a tuppence. I don't know what a tuppence was, but he was really excited about it. That is human nature. We won. Discounts. Of course, the perverse thing is happening is when the market crashes. A market crash is essentially a sale. You go past your local Edgar's and there's a sale on, you rush in and buy cheap clothes. The market crashes, what, what do we got? We've got a sale. And we all panic and sell and go hide our head under the sand. So it's that disconnect. And, then, and, and that's classic human nature just because, you know, um, uh, George Orwell in 1984 coined the phrase double speak, the ability to have two contradictory thoughts in your mind at the same time without your head exploding. And in truth, as human beings, we're very good at that. 
and not just politicians. I mean, we are too. Politicians are the masters. We are just uh, the apprentices, but we have the ability to do it. So it's about the bar how bar high, so even higher. And that's counterintuitive to who we are. And I stress again, I'm not saying don't do others. I'm saying have this as a concept. And whether you're trading or investing, it's something which, which is worth pondering on and seeing if we can't stick it into our strategies and make ourselves more profitable. The point is momentum works. There are, I mean, when I was doing, uh, uh, putting this presentation together, and I've been actively trading momentum strategy for a number of years, and I'll touch on that in more detail in a bit. Um, and I've done a lot of research around it. And I went to over the weekend and tried to find what research was available. And there were literally dozens, I mean, easily 50 plus papers. And I mean, two of them are master's dissertations that have been done, one at UCT, one at WITS. Um, we've got ones out of Cambridge, MIT. We've got uh, uh, capital management, asset management firms out of the US, the UK, Australia, uh, Western, Eastern Europe. Tons of research. This is one particular one, sources, The Economist. It should say that somewhere, but I will say it instead for The Economist. Um, and this was uh, particularly three guys, Dimson, Marsh, and Stutton. And this is the guys I always quote from the London uh, Business School. And what they wanted to say was, can we quantifiably say that winners do better, losers do worse, and the average does middling? Sure, to me, that makes sense. So what they basically did is this chart gives you the stocks that were the top 20%. And what I mean by top 20%, the stocks that gave you the best return, the, the, the 20 out of the FTSE 100, they would go every month and say, what were the best performing stocks in the last month? And put them into a basket. What were the 20 worst stocks that month? Put them into a basket. And then the remaining 60 stay in the middle. Month later, rinse and repeat. Month later, rinse and repeat. From 1990 through to uh, 2010, when they when they ceased the, 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 did the rest of, published the research for N of 9, the difference is humongous. The losers have turned a pound into 49 pounds. The middlings have turned it into 20,000 pounds. And the winners into 2.3 million. Winners tend to go higher. Don't be scared of high prices. Because the high prices can just get significantly higher. So as I said, a ton of research out there. A lot of it very academic. I mean, big words, words. Words that hurt my head. But that nice simple picture says to us, and in fact, they had to log scale the chart because if they didn't, there simply wasn't enough space to show the 2.3 million. So what are we? A, a phrase that popped up a year or two ago, that fear of missing out, FOMO, which popped up around, it certainly was all over Twitter and stuff. And throwing a couple out there, I mean, we go all the way back to the tulip bubble. I mean, who thought in the 1500s that a tulip could be worth more than your house? It's complete and utter madness. And then the question is, are we talking about bubbles? And I'm going to address that one later, so I'll park that issue for now. But we've seen them. I mean, Facebook, and I was saying just a moment ago, I remember when uh, Facebook had 500 million active users per month. And I thought, yo, 500 million, giant number. Yo, can't get any bigger. Now they're at 1.27 something. They're at 1.3 billion monthly active users. Now, and then you say, well, how much bigger can I get? WhatsApp, which got purchased this morning for $19 billion by Facebook, uh, are signing up 1 million users per day. Capitec signs up uh, 100,000 clients per month. 100,000. Your first response is, surely we run out of people eventually? But the truth, 100,000 a month is only 1.2 million a year. Uh, let's say there are 25 million adults in, in, in the country, uh, and assuming they take every bank account from every other bank, they can carry on going for 25 years. So we think 100,000, and we think that's going to run out of runway quick. Uh, in the next six months, they're going to run out of space. They've been signing 100,000 users a month now for four years. Ergo, they're at 5 million plus users. Not users, clients. That's the right word. Users is probably the impolite phrase. Uh, Rubik's Cube, and I remember you have to be fairly old to remember Rubik's Cube, but you know, there was a time in the 80s where, where you know, Rubik's Cube initially were the nerds. A couple of us had our Rubik's Cube, and the challenge was, could you solve it in under 60 seconds? And if you really wanted to impress someone, you did it behind your back in under 60 seconds. There was a trick to that. I'm not going to tell you the trick. Um, I'll tell you the trick. You sanded the corners so you could feel what the colors were. Um, and then, you know, then suddenly it wasn't just us nerds who had them. Suddenly everyone started to have them. And then you had two or three because you had different colors. And Rubik's Cube went absolutely crazy. They sold hundreds of millions of them. 
I mean, they'd initially prototyped it, and, and, and uh, the guys who did it and proposed it to some particular, their target was 10,000. They thought they could sell 10,000 around the world. And they sold ton, tons, tons and tons and tons. And, and certainly we've seen it less so these days. Again, if you go back to the 80s and 90s, that Christmas rush, a certain toy for kids, uh, Cabbage Patch Dolls one year. I don't even know what a Cabbage Patch Doll is, but my research told me that Cabbage Patch Doll was like the hottest thing ever for like a brief window. Uh, 3D, I don't know, back in the 80s, suddenly there was 3D, Jaws 3D, Superman 3D. A couple of years ago, there was 3D TV. We get these these rushes that happen, and it's that human nature. Initially, it's a small little segment, and then it kind of breaks out of its segment, and that's the critical point, that breaking out of its niche. How did Rubik's Cube go from nerds to everybody? And, and I, I don't know the answer to that one. How did Facebook go from a couple of people to absolutely everyone? Facebook's quite simple. The biggest demographic, fastest growing demographic in Facebook is the plus 55. How else do you keep track of your grandchildren? Hey, they're not writing you letters, sending you emails or photographs, are they? And in fact, the grandchildren are now leaving Facebook because I don't like being stalked by parents and grandparents. But the point is that the parents are posting the pictures of the grandchildren. That makes perfect sense. That's how face and Facebook started. I mean, if we go all the way back ten years ago to when Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook in his in his dorm room, essentially he was just trying to start something to find the hot girls on campus. That was his plan. And he thought, what better? We'll have a database, have a picture, a contact address. Brilliant. We'll find the hot and status, single or not. And then it, it, it started, and then initially you had to have a .edu email address, i.e. you had to be a student to have access to it. And then it, it broke out of that. And its initial traction was almost nothing, almost nothing. And then it started to go, and the biggest explosion has literally been grandparents want to follow their grandchildren. They want to see, uh, these days with every phone being a digital camera, suddenly every moment is being recorded a thousand times, and, and someone does care, the grandparents. Uh, Bitcoin, another one. I mean, uh, and Bitcoin's a little bit odd. Bitcoin is is, is currently exploding in our face. Um, but you know, Bitcoin, you know, it's, it's the, the the cryptocurrency concept actually goes back to the 80s. And it was, that wasn't even for nerds. That was for like five or six complete crazy people at MIT. And then slowly it starts to gather some traction. Slowly it starts to get some some places. Uh, suddenly Bitcoin's exploded. And what's interesting with Bitcoin is that there are currently 85 tra tradable cryptocurrencies in the world, 85. But if you go to coingen.io, you can create your own cryptocurrency with your own mining and your own logo and everything else. So you can have Simon super duper cryptocurrency. So there's many of them. There's not just Bitcoin, but Bitcoin's the one that succeeded. Ditto, we go to the Rubik's Cube. You had eight-sided ones. You had 10-sided ones. Yet, But that classic one, that's the one that stayed. So there's going to be a whole swelling. If we go to Facebook, there, well, there was MySpace. Um, there's been numerous other, so uh, Google Plus. Google Plus is paid. I mean, yeah, they've got 200 million users. I mean, BBM's probably got 200 million users. Doesn't say a heck of a lot. It's not that the entire sector succeeds. It's that one within succeeds. And maybe it's two or three or something. Certainly, Twitter's fairly well done. And, and uh, if you had stock in, in, in WhatsApp, which wasn't publicly tradable, you've probably done quite well. So it's about spotting those trends and then finding the winners within it. The point is, I, I, I usually say we lack ambition, but I decided when I was putting this together that that was perhaps a, a nasty statement to say on people who've given up their Thursday evening. We lack conviction. We buy that stock. And it goes up 20 or 30%. And we think we are absolutely fundamentally winning. We think we are the cleverest thing in the world. And part of it is we want that positive affirmation. We want to lock in the profit. And I, I told the story before. I, I once had two, two positions in the market. And I needed to sell one of them. Oh, I can't remember why, but I needed some cash. Um, one of them was, <clears throat> excuse me, one was a position in profit. One was a position in loss. So what did I do? I sold the one that was in profit. Everyone's like, well, of course, you locked in profit. That's the point. You had a winner. Why did we abandon the winner and keep the loser? That's my phone. We did it for a very simple reason. So that we could lock in the, the rush from the winner and we could mark it down as, yeah, made money. 
And third, if you can give the loser time to become a winner. It's real simple. You've got a winner, you've got a loser, you back the winner. Sell the loser. But intuitively, we say, no, 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 we want to lock it. And that's why when we buy a stock and it goes up, you know, the, the, the mythical 10-bagger. We all talk, oh, we want a 10-bagger. But how often have we owned a share that down the line, and not short-term down the line, uh, uh, many years, maybe a decade later, is a 10-bagger? And we owned it way back at the beginning. But we sold it when it was a half, a, you know, when it was up 20%, 50%. Maybe we held for 100%, and that was like really a big deal. We lack that conviction. We lack that conviction that things can go to the moon. We, 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 are, we are so eager to lock in that profit, and we're so unconvinced. We, you know, we've got that anchoring effect. The anchoring effect. The, where, and who was I chatting to? Hello, Giosi, uh, just the other day, in fact, Tuesday. And he's saying one of, the, one, of the, one of the best things you can do as an investor or a trader is forget the price you paid. Yet almost every stock I've bought, I know the price. And some stocks like Sasso, I've bought it over the last 20 years. I've probably bought Sasso six times and I can tell you each price I've paid. You know, back to 20 odd rand in 92 to 350 rand uh, sometime last year. And we absolutely anchor to it. The point is, Forget the price you paid. That, that, that's now done. It's finished. Now your job is to try and max, to get out at the highest possible level and to run it for as long as possible. So it's that lacking conviction. And the key point, time. We, and I, I always had this theory that, you know, ah, oh, the new generation, things are so much quicker. We've got cell phones and that, noise on my phone with someone currently uh, WhatsApping me who's in London and, you know, the world has shrunk. But every generation, the world has shrunk. My grandfather was born in 1896. He lived for 98 years. And he, I remember that he told me the story about the first time he saw a motor car in Durban. And he saw this thing and he just laughed. He thought this was the stupidest thing he had ever seen. It was smelly. It was dirty. It was noisy. And it didn't even go very fast. And in this particular one, it was stuck in a rut. They had the, the trams and West Street and the like. And this they got stuck in one of the tram lines. And it was like, that is just stupid. So I suspect every generation is saying, you know, our generation is faster, smarter, cleverer. That's probably not new. We all, we all think our generation's the best. But the point being is that we underestimate, in truth, the slowness. So over my Christmas holidays for, I don't even know why, I, I read, uh, in fact, I reread uh, Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital, Karl Marx. And one thing, two things struck me. Firstly, he's right. Capitalism will eat itself. 100% right about that. But more importantly is that when I look, when, when I think about uh, 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 das Kapital, a communist manifesto. I'm like, no, man, come on. You wrote those books 170 years ago. Our ah, world's moved on. No, no, no. When he writes those books, he starts at like, you know, 1000 BC. And he's talking about capitalism eating itself in like 4000 AD. And it occurred to me, things happen one heck lot slower than we ever imagined. And the best current example that is playing out um, is the, I'll give you two examples. I remember going on air uh, sort of around September 2008. So just before Lehman Brothers collapses. Um, yeah, it was just before Lehman Brothers. Bronwyn Nielsen says to me, so how long is this crisis going to take? So I think of the longest period I can and I say, oh, this could run until 2011. Well, here we're in 2014, and, and the crisis has passed, but the medicine is still there. We've got quantitative easing. We've got tapering. We've still got economies that are struggling. So the biggest number I could think of, and, well, so far I'm out by three years. And, in fact, you know what? I said three years, so I'm out by 100%. And, and, and the clock is still running. Think about the retail space. So the, the worries around the retail space started to rear their head two years ago, maybe two and a half years ago. Consumers under pressure, uh, slightly increasing debt levels, inability to, to service debt. You know, thank goodness for low interest rates. About a year and a half ago, towards the end of 2012, most of our retailers peaked. ShopRite at 210, uh, Woolies at about 86, 88. And then yesterday, Woolies has a good day, and it goes from below 60 to above 60, and everyone's like, "Wow, we missed Woolies." 
I mean, this retail disaster, not, I don't want to call it disaster, this retail scenario that is currently playing out in this African space, it's going to play out for another year or two. And we forget how slowly things actually happen. The fact that I can bang off a message and it'll be on someone's phone in London in a second doesn't mean that the process of economics, of human nature, actually happens slowly. Construction. I went bullish in construction five years ago. Held them for two years, went sideways, sold them. The particular stock was Steph Stocks. I paid 10 Rand for it. Two years later, I sold it for 10 Rand, and today it's 9 Rand 80. Is construction going to turn one day? Of course. Which day? I, I have no. Pick a day. Pick a, a, some, it won't be today. It probably won't be tomorrow. Beyond that, I'm not sure. So it's that slowness, which I think we as human beings just simply don't grasp. We, we're looking for that. We're looking for instant gratification. And, and we get it all over the place. But in truth, things play out a lot, lot slower. The two pic pictures to illustrate. This is NASPASS. Broke 100 bucks in about 2005 sometime. And there's the sort of first move. There's your second move. There's your third move. And if you had bought it, so what have we got? We've got a 10-bagger. In fact, we've got a 13-bagger. No, I lie. We've got about a 22-bagger in 10 years. 22 times up in 10 years. Now, if I told you back then, buy an SPAS at, you know, 60 bucks and hold it for 10 years to 22 times your money, you would have liked, absolutely. But in truth, how many times, myself included, Along this rise, have we said, no, man, this is crazy. How far can NASPASS go? Now, there's a singular event in NASPASS that triggers it, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But it's that process. And yes, it's got a little bit crazy there. So I go to my next favorite chart. This is the ND25 index. Again, 10-bagger. Yeah, you were buying it back. My numbers have too many zeros, but you were buying it at around 5,000 in 2003, and it's now 54,000. And it's been a little bit rocky in places. But the point being is that it has moved. It's got that momentum. And this is, if you take the Finney 15 chart, it doesn't look like that. If you take the Resi 10 chart, it doesn't look like that. And if you take the top 40, of course it doesn't because that's an amalgamation of the three ultimately. And the point is, it's about that time. If you had bought the Indy back here, and let's be completely nasty and pick the absolute low in 2003, end of the bear market, you paid 5,000, and it gets to that point and it starts to fall, and you say to yourself, man, I'm up threefold, I'm taking my money and running. And today you're up 11-fold. Takes time. And I know we can trade derivative products and we can get Aussie futures and you can make 100 points in 12 seconds flat if you can click a mouse that quick. Or you could lose 100 points probably in 6 seconds flat. We seem to lose money faster than we make it. But in the bigger picture, things are playing out slowly in the background. As those things, structures happen, as the markets rush in, as people become cognizant of it. Back here, we had no idea. I mean, what's been driving this, this? It's been, what's been driving the N25 is the stock. It will have a common theme. So it's been your SAB Millers. It's been your Richmonds. It's been your, um, and then my mind goes blank. What's that other one? Aspen. Um, and, uh, British American Tobacco. What do they all have as a co common theme? They, they stay global players who sell into emerging markets. The best way to make money from emerging markets was not to buy the emerging market. It was to buy the giant global companies that were selling and operating in the emerging markets. If you want exposure to beer drinkers in emerging markets, you buy SAB. You want exposure to smokers in emerging markets, you buy BTI. You want exposure to drug takers, that, um, to drugs in emerging markets, you buy Aspen. You want exposure to smartphones and technology in emerging markets, you buy MTN. Now, that's unique to our, not unique, but if you're sitting in London, yeah, you can buy Vodafone. If you're sitting in the US, you can buy AT&T or Sprint, but they've got no emerging market exposure. And this happened. I mean, we must remember that at this point back here, Iran was where it is today. 
So this is not RAND weakness. And in fact, if we go back two years, our RAND was at 13.70, 13.80 to the dollar at the end of 20, 2001. So it's not been driven by RAND weakness. This has been driven by the desire of people to get exposure to emerging markets. The mistake we thought was they wanted everything in emerging markets. Ah, uh, yes, but actually they wanted a few niches. So what did they do? They bought the best companies, the best global companies that were going into the emerging space. SAB Miller, one of the top management teams this planet has ever seen without a shadow of a doubt. And if, if you want to do an MBA, nonsense, don't do an MBA, go work for SAB Miller. You'll get way better experience. I mean, the number of CEOs who've come out, I mean, my favorite CEO, Kevin Hedewick, SAB Miller. And so the list goes on. So it's about spotting it. So we all thought the story was the commodity, the, the commodity super cycle. And if you bought the right stock, Billiton, you've done all right. If you bought the wrong stock, Anglo, well, you're not so happy camper. But the bigger story was emerging markets. And in fact, there's a bigger story behind that, urbanization. And I'll touch on that in a bit. We see it everywhere, revolutions, to go back to my core Marx theme. These service delivery protests, I've been doing a whole lot of research on service delivery protests we've been seeing around South Africa. The key point is, we don't hear about it until there's a, suddenly a burning tire somewhere. And then boom, it's all over the news. But if you go do the research and you go and dig around, the average, when we see a burning tire, the average service delivery protest is two years old. What's happened is there's been a failure of grassroots politics. They've gone to their ward councillor, they've gone to their councillors, they've gone to the mayor, they've gone to the premier, they've tried all the avenues and they've gone nowhere. And it's that slow gathering of steam until eventually it, it explodes out into a revolution. And I know if you look back to the Russian revolution, we talk about those 17 days where we had three changes of power and suddenly Lenin was the ruler of Russia and the, the, the royal family was now dead. But in truth, that goes back again to the 1860s. Take South Africa's example. You know, suddenly Mandela's free, suddenly we are voting. But that goes back, we can go back to the formation of the controversies where in the 60s, but in truth, we can go back to the formation of the Pan-Africanist Party and the African National Congress in the sort of time of World War I. Massively slow, massively powerful, building and bubbling up. Not happening overnight in any sense. Sports, and I put a question mark next to the Proteas because we're only day one of test two, and I don't know what we closed at. Last I saw, we were 100 and something for four. But it's, it, it, people say, well, how, do the, how, how come the Australians dominated for so long in cricket? Okay, the point being is that they also did have some of the, I mean, they, they had a team with like three of the best players ever. I mean, they had uh, Warren, Gilchrist, I mean, they had an amazing team. But we understand that concept of, of the winning culture and how winning breeds winning and continues to do so, same sort of concept, and how teams will dominate for long periods of time. Go back to the, 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 the Mean Machine Transvaal cricket team of the 1980s, look at the Blue Bulls for a number of years here in South Africa, in the, in the rugby space. You get that clear leader of the pack. We see it in the mobile app space. That perhaps is a little more flash and pan, but Flappy Bird suddenly go, and I've never played Flappy Bird, um, and now that I say it, it's a crazy name. But anyway, um, it, it was this random app which did nothing, and it goes in early December from averaging 10 downloads a day to when he shuts it down a couple of weeks ago, it is averaging a million downloads an hour. Just explodes, just absolutely explodes. And then what do you see? You see all of the the uh, 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 sort of mock ones coming up. So now you've got douche bir birds and you've got flappy pigs and all of those sort of things start to spring up as well. That driving force, that momentum, which, which, which slowly gathers steam. And we don't see it in the early days. I mean, this chart, both charts, and back here, I mean, NASPAS only bought 10 cent around here. 10 cent, well, it was nothing. At this point here, they got involved in mail rue and got a stake in Facebook. We didn't, we'd never heard of Facebook at that point. Ditto with the, with, with the Indy. I mean, uh, the Indy, perhaps we could spin it slightly different. But it's easy in hindsight to say, hey, uh, where's my time machine? Take me back 10 years. 
We need that catalyst. We need something that triggers it. Something. In the case of service delivery protests and the one uh, that we had in Gauteng just recently, suddenly the water stopped working. And it wasn't that the water hadn't worked all... Blah, I'm not trying to say this. The water was infrequent. Sometimes it would, sometimes it wouldn't. The difference was, this time it didn't come back after one day, after two days. Boom, catalyst, burning tires in the streets. There needs to be that catalyst. So something has to kick it off. In the case of the Indy, it was a sudden desire to get emerging market exposure. Why? Because developed markets, Western Europe and North America, were not giving any returns. Their markets were going nowhere. Why were their markets going nowhere? Well, quite simply, the logic behind, they were, they were, they were mature markets. You know, pretty much everyone who wants to live in a city in America lives in a city. Now, that's not true, but broadly it is. So car probably has one. Yes, they have the market all the time. But what you don't get in the emerged markets, what you do get in the emerging markets is urbanization. We still have, and I don't know what the number is, but we easily have in this country 10 or 20 million people who live a rural lifestyle. And whilst some of us who live in cities think the idea of a rural lifestyle is idyllic and would be lovely, the average person living in a rural lifestyle with, you want water, well, there's a, a river, you want to go to the toilet, well, there's a bush, most of those people are saying, give me a city. It's the challenge our government's had with land restitution. An individual doesn't want an acre of land in the middle of, of KZN, they want a flat in a city. So we've seen it in South Africa. We call it the, 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 the black diamonds. Uh, yes, no, maybe. We've seen it in China. 350 million Chinese people in the last decade have gone from rural subsistence to living in a city. And what do they do when they move? They suck in with it. So a person lives in a, in a rural existence and moves to a city. What do they do? They start getting a little bit, a little bit more affluent. They go and get... Not a smartphone, a dumb phone. But what are they doing on their dumb phone? Well, they're making phone calls and making money for MTN. Not in the case of China, but you get the point. And that wasn't happening before. Not a lot of money, but a little bit. And then things get slightly better. And then one day they realize, hey, we actually could employ someone to clean our house. Boom, another person comes in from a rural area. Now, in China, they can manage it. You know, when they've got too many people in the city, they close the gates and they wait until demand. And, and then what you typically have is you have a complete influx too fast into the cities. And you get what we've got in South Africa and to a much larger degree in places like Rio de Janeiro um, and, 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 and in large cities in India, where you get the, the absolute poverty squatter camps around the cities. As people have flocked to the city and the cities simply can't absorb them just yet. But you're still seeing massive significant urbanization, you're seeing massive significant con consumerization, people spending money, people earning money, and it's that vicious circle. The person who gets a dumb phone and now makes a phone call in a cellular network who a couple of years ago didn't even have a telephone at home is creating more revenue for the operator. The operator by default is buying more phones which creates more revenue for the manufacturers, installing more towers. You see the ripple. I mean, this is, this is not even economics 101, it's just economics 1. And you need that catalyst. And here the catalyst is simple. If you live in a rural area, you want to live in a city. You want to have a job. You want to have a house. You want to have the, 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 the car. You want to have the phone. And that starts and then gathers the momentum. So we need those catalysts. Some examples. So Coronation was their growing assets under management. Why did Coronation assets under management start to grow? A couple of things. But part of it was that they, uh, Alan Gray, I don't want to say lost their way, but Alan Gray for a long time had been the asset house, and Coronation basically started doing better than them in their longer-term funds. So asset managers start putting money into Coronation. Managers start wanting to work for Coronation rather than Alan Gray. And initially, it's slow and nothing much happening. And then if you look at the Coronation assets under management, it's picking up, picking, and that it just goes exponential. And now it's at the point where it's kind of leveling off. Now, when you've got 520-odd billion assets under management, it's not easy to grow that at 25% per quarter. You get to that saturation point. 
Point being is that saturation point happens a lot further down. Back to my Facebook story, I thought half a billion users per month was a huge amount. Now they're at one and a quarter billion. Is that the top? I don't know. I can tell you that seven billion will absolutely be the top because we've run out of people. NASPASS was 10 cent. So Kurt Becker has used the analogy. He says, you know what, buying these companies are like throwing spaghetti at the wall. Man, you throw a handful of spaghetti, maybe one piece sticks. Chris just goes and buys stuff. And most of them fail. Suddenly one of them starts to work. And Tencent was incredibly hard to spot because what Tencent is doing didn't exist 10 years ago. We didn't have social networks. We didn't have smartphones. We didn't have virtual currencies. We didn't have online games. Uh, we had the online games, but in a very different type of space. So Tencent was very hard to spot. NASPASS was very hard to spot. Prior to that, they were boring. They owned DSTV, they owned uh, uh, Media24, magazines, websites, stuff like that. But even DSTV, I mean, the growth of DSTV has been phenomenal. And it's <coughs> excuse me, been driven by a couple of things. One, get the sport, charge a premium. Two, offer a 20 rand service. There's DST Compact, and I'm not, I, I didn't even know what DST, DST Compact, when it launched, cost 20 bucks. And it maybe now costs 30 or 40 per month. And 15 years ago, if you did a road trip around South Africa, National Flower was a plastic bag caught on a barbed wire fence. The last, last this Christmas and two years before, I did a road trip 5,000 kilometers driving around South Africa, a lot of it in rural areas. National Flower, satellite dish. Man, you are in deepest, darkest rural areas. And there's not one satellite dish. There are satellite dishes. You see a hill and there's literally a hut and a satellite dish. Why? Aspirational. Entertainment. There's not a lot else to do on that hillside. So we've seen that shift coming through. That was hard to spot. ShopRite. One of the biggest drivers around ShopRite, and there's been a lot of drivers around ShopRite, one of the biggest drivers behind ShopRite has been social grants. For a poor person, your single two biggest expenses are transport, which is only applicable if you have a job, and food. And as soon as you get a little bit more money, you buy a slightly better quality of food, you buy a slightly more quality of food, and the, the boom in social grants, and, 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 and there's, a, you know, there's a political view on social grants, are they good or bad? Irrelevant, we have them. And next Wednesday, Praveen Gordon will stand up and announce a budget in an election year. And what's going to happen? He's going to increase social grants. And where's a large portion of that money going to flow? ShopRite. Yes, transport. Yes, builder's warehouse. But the big chunk goes through ShopRite. It gets spent. It comes back into the economy. And that is a fundamental shift. When we, not when we started social grants, South Africa had always had a level of social grant, unemployment and old age pensions, neither of them particularly exciting. But certainly what we saw was an expansion of that. And the reality is that the average social grant still goes to a person either over the age of 60 or under the age of 80. Something like, and I forget the exact number, it's 70 or 80 percent of social grants go to the, the, the under 18s or the over 60s. Because it's our child grants and it's our old age pensions and they get spent. And a chunk of that goes to ShopRite. So yes, ShopRite's a brilliant company. It's incredibly well run. They've moved into the rest of Africa. They're doing great stuff in the rest of Africa. Pick and pay, lost their way. That made it easier for ShopRite. But that is a catalyst for a game changer. And they, I was going to say they're very easy. That's not true. They are easier to spot in hindsight. I get that. To look back and say, Ah, that's what the trigger was, yes. It's always harder at the coalface to be standing there now and saying, what's that catalyst? What's the, the next driver coming through? And sometimes they work the other way. I talked about, I mentioned uh, JD Group and African Bank being legislated out of business. National Credit Act, Consumer Protection Act, but let's look at the banking sector. The heyday of mega profits out of banks is over. Post-2008, what's happened? We have had significant more regulation. 
which makes it difficult for banks to do that reckless and inverted commas trading. And I put the inverted commas because that's a debate all on its own, which I, we don't need to have now. It's added significant levels of compliance, which is a cost, and significant increases in capital adequacy ratios, Basel III, which kicks in later this decade. And those collectively means banks will still make money. They will always make money. They're banks. But their ability to make money is being hindered. And then you've got the whipsnapper, Capitec. So I don't know what your bank account costs you every month. Mine costs me the astoundingly, amazingly large amount of 285 Rand per month. That is four bottles of semi-decent wine. In fact, that's four bottles of decent wine if you shop smart. So what does a Capitec bank account cost? Five Rand and 60 cents. Five Rand and 60 cents. That gives you access to money withdrawals. It gives you access to internet banking. Now, if you want a home loan, Capitec can't help you yet. If you want vehicle finance, Capitec can't help you yet. If you want fancy things, the Capitec saying, you know what banking is? Banking's just a place to park your money. Do you need rewards programs so that when you buy something, you get money back? No, you need a place to park your money. You want it to be secure, and when you take it out, you want it to be cheap. That's all you really want from banking. Capitec can do it at five bucks, six, five rand sixty per client per month, and they make a profit. And in fact, their cost to income ratio is thirty odd percent. So they're making almost seventy cents per rand. The big banks' cost to income ratio mid fifties. So the big banks charge me two hundred and eighty five rand, but only make forty five cents in the rand. Fundamental shift. What did Capitec do? Started late, paperless, centralized. Everything is centralized, everything is paperless. There is no paper in Capitec's life. The banks would love, the big banks would love to get there. Their problem is they've got a hundred and fifty two years legacy paper. And I tell you what, in some banks they're still in the corner. So the momentum from the banks is gone, the big banks. The momentum in the banking space is going to come from those whipsnappers, Capitec. And you look at Capitec at 200 Rand and you think, whoa, no man, it's expensive and look at Able and Capitec is not Able. Able was a furniture retailer who made money by selling your insurance products. Capitec don't sell furniture. That's not their model. Their model is transactional banking. They are going to expand. They will one day offer you home loans and, and, and credit cards and all of that sort of thing. Will the uh, unsecured lending uh, 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 crunch, which we're currently living through, hurt them? Yes. Will it hurt them to the degree it has hurt JD Group and African Bank? No, not even close. And in fact, Keith McLaughlin has uh, crunched numbers on it, and he keeps on saying to me, man, he, he thinks Capitec's actually attractive at these price points. Intuitively, you say, hang on, man, that's the stock that's gone from one round to 200 rand in 12 years. What do you mean you're buying it? Well, I could go to 2000. If Capitec is the future of banking, it could go to 2000 rand. I'm not saying it will. I'm saying it certainly has that ability. And when I say Capitec is the future of banking, that is going to be a slow change because I know that I pay 285 rand and that I could pay 279 rand and 40 cents less and get a Capitec account. Yet I don't have a Capitec account, do I? And I'm not the only one. But at some point, I'm going to bite the bullet. Yeah. I have a personal banker, lovely guy. I'm paying a lot of money for him. I never speak to him. I think he's a lovely guy. Sends me an email once a year, says, hope your year's good. Cool. My wife's a perfect candidate. My wife's terrified of banks. She's exactly the person who, if she realized how much she was paying on fees, and she doesn't because she never opens her bank statements and doesn't have internet banking, but if she knew what she was paying on fees and that she could go to Capitec for five rand sixty, she'd be there in five minutes flat. Capitec is going to be, to my mind, the biggest bank in South Africa in my lifetime. And I plan to live for a lot longer, so there's you know, 60, 70 years away. Point being is they're going to get there. So I hold Standard Bank shares, and the dilemma in my mind right now, and it's tilting very definitely, I think it's time to take those Standard Bank shares and let someone else hold them. That gets complicated because I do some work for Standard Bank. 
So it's about those mega trends, and I've been talking about the mega trends, commodity super cycle. Now, the commodity super cycle was frankly a bit of a damp squid. Yes, we saw gold go to $1,911 back in April 2011. Uh, yes, the mines made some money, but frankly not nearly as much money as they should have. Yes, iron ore did brilliantly. Coal did okay. Copper, well, had some good days, some bad days. And platinum, well, platinum's complicated. But the other ones is the connected age which is your NASPAS, which is your smartphones, which is your WhatsApps and your Facebooks. And, and, and that is a fundamental shift. I mean, when I, when I was at school in Pinetown in, in, back in the 80s, I mean, we had a computer at school. Yeah. One. It was a Commodore 64K. So when I say 64K, I mean it had 64K of memory. Now I've got to do the math. So there are how many, so, so like, uh, we're rounding the numbers. Eight Commodores equal a megabyte. A megabyte. That phone has got 64 gigabytes on it. I mean, the explosion has been insane. When I was at school doing computer science in my matric year, three of us out of 169 boys did computer science. We actually had to go to Edgewood College to do the computer science because no one at Pine Town could teach it. And then when we went back and we saw that there was a computer, we hacked it and changed the password. And no one in the school had a clue what to do. It was like, hmm, I think we need a new computer. Now, my nephew, five years old, playing on computers. My niece at three years old is swiping away on the iPad. The connected age has fundamentally shifted things. It's shifted in the ability to communicate and to transact, and all of that's critically important. But don't necessarily look at it straight on. Maybe look at it sideways. Capitec. Paperless banking. So Capitec's riding two waves in a sense. The connected age, where they've managed to really be a new age type of bank, a new, I don't say new media, a, a, a new technology sort of bank. And the others prior, the other banks have got beautiful apps and this and that, and yeah, 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 yeah. Capitec's slaughtering them every which way you can. The huge one is urbanization. Is the single biggest, to my mind, the single biggest mega trend that we're going to see in our lifetimes. And that urbanization drives so many, it, it drives oil. If Chinese people consumed the same amount of oil per year that American people do, we would run out of oil on Tuesday. Okay, that is a complete over exaggeration, but you get the point. I forget the numbers, but the average American consumes, I think, something like 65 times more oil per Chinese person. Because oil is not direct. It's not just your petrol. It's, it's plastics and all of those polymers and stuff like that. So again, it's, it's, it's from the oblique side. Yes, there's going to be demand for cars. So platinum. Platinum goes into cars. Important point. Understand the distinction between platinum and palladium. Platinum goes into diesel vehicles. That's Europe. Platinum goes into petrol vehicles. Other way around. Platinum goes into diesel vehicles, Europe. Palladium goes into petrol vehicles, which is America, Africa, and Asia. So actually, palladium is the better metal than platinum. And these are the implications for that crazy urbanization. Those 350 million Chinese people who have moved into a city in the last decade, they might not have a car, but they want one. And you know what? They are closer to getting one. So to me, connected age, got it. Urbanization, that is the mega trend of our future. And it is going to play out in, in it plays out in SAB Miller. It plays out in British American Tobacco. Almost any consumer brand. There's a company in America that makes leotards. Okay, they make more than leotards, but, but that's what they're famous for. And they've seen crazy numbers increase. Not because suddenly everyone's rushing off and eating leotards, but because suddenly there are so many more people living in cities, and some people who live in cities decide that they should go to gym and yoga and run in the park and other such crazy things. So it's not just spotting the trend, it's spotting where it plugs in. Capitec plugs into both of them. It's hurting. 
individual mimic the action of a larger group individually. However, most people would not necessarily make the same choice. What am I saying by that? We see a stock running, we jump on the bus without even thinking about it. Yes, there's a great fundamental story, and we sit down and we work out the story, and we understand the tra trends, and we see the catalysts happening, and we say to ourselves, yep, but there's a much broader space out there. And folks are like, wow, there's a bus, there's a bus, let me jump on it. They're on it, now they don't know quite where it is. And it's that power of, that, of, of the herd, that, that power of, of, of the collective of the crowd. That's the phrase I'm looking for. An individual is fairly smart. Well, depends on the individual, but the point is a crowd is that collective, that, that enthusiasm that sways along. You see it, the Mexican waves at the cricket not in St. George's Park because there was no one watching the cricket. So coming to price increases, you resist, you call it a bubble, you call it every dirty name under the sun, you refuse to get involved, and eventually it's like, oh, I give up and I get in. And we think we run out of people. There are always more people. There are always fund managers who have more money than they know what to do with. They've got money flowing in. They need to be invested somewhere. They're terrified of missing out because if they miss out, their peers are going to beat them in the performance indices. They're going to do underperform the index. They're not going to get bonuses. The easiest way to get a bonus is just buy those things that everyone else is buying. Now, why is everyone else buying them? Not important, but they are, and I want to make some money as well. Are there bubbles? Maybe. Sometimes they definitely are. And almost any Massive level of momentum, and if we go back to ah, NASPAS, but there was a 2008-9, yeah, I mean, global financial crisis, but fairly significant pullback. I mean, are there going to be bubbles? Yes. Oh, should we be scared of bubbles? Well, only when they pop. And how do you know when they pop? Well, they start falling at incredibly fast paces, and the point is, when it's time to panic, panic fast. Which, oddly enough, although I'm a very slow thinker, I'm a very good panicker. I mean, I remember I held Gajima, and I'm at the airport in Cape Town one morning, and I see this sense announcement there, who am I online contract has been cancelled. And I'm taking off. My plane takes off at 9 o'clock. And the market, and I, I, I phone the dealers at online share trading, and I say, I want to sell. And they say, what price? I said, whatever price it is trading at. I just want out. And they say, well, did you land in two hours? Don't you want to sell in two hours? It's like, no, 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 it's time to panic. I think I sold at 84 cents. The day before, it had been one, 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 one and change. Got out at 84. A week later, it's at 90. I'm looking a little bit silly, but what's it today? I mean, rights issue, blah, 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 it's worthless. Able. Time to panic. That first, you've got a myth, you, you've got something which, the, the, what am I trying to say? You've got that core thing which attracts you, that, that what is it? What is it that's driving this trend? When it snaps, get the heck out of Dodge. When Abel loses control of its lending book, don't ask questions, just get out. Yeah, I know, the stock has fallen 16%, but if you had panicked on the first sign of bad news with Abel, you sold a 24 rand. And I don't think Abel will ever get back to 24 rand unless they do a share consolidation. So when, when, when there's that driver, there will be bubbles, there will things will be pop. But the point being as well is that sometimes it's a fundamental shift that's happened. It's the, 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 the social grants driving ShopRite. And I know ShopRite's pulled back significantly. It's 10 cents into NASPAS. It's, it, it, there's, there's a strong underpinning. Coronation's risk is that, excuse me, as much as Coronation upsurped Alan Gray, someone will upsurp Coronation. It'll happen. Uh, will their price collapse? Nah, it might just stop growing as fast. So yes, bubbles are a risk. But don't be so scared of a bubble that you, oh, this is a bubble I need to get out. If you're sitting on 900% profit, you know what? If you only sell at 800% profit, you're not going to go broke. Give it wiggle room. Give it time. Courage of the conviction. Identify the trends, find the stocks that plug into those trends, and don't buy the maybes. Buy the out-and-out -out winners. Buy those that you know will. F&B talk a great game, but they are not cappy check. They have 132 years of paper hiding in their cupboards. 
and eventually everyone's got an iPad and then the motivation for joining f and is gone. And it, it gets rough. There are no straight lines in the stock markets. But I was having coffee with someone this afternoon and if, if we can over an investing lifetime get a couple of massive trades wrong, not a, not a dozen, if we can get one every five or ten years, if we can get those, forget ten baggers, if we can get those 30, 40, 50 baggers that are going to play out over 10, 15, 20 years, if we can get a few of those, it is massively, massively powerful. And in a sense, we don't just say, well, it's Capitech. Okay, cool. We sell the kids, we bond the house, we walk to work, we put everything in Capitech. No, 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 that's crazy risk. We manage the risk, we say, okay, eh, we like it, let's play in the space, but certainly let's be here, let's hold it, let's drive it, let's run with it. And give it that space to run. So it's about those mega trends, it's about the winners, it's about who is going to be left standing. That's who you, the horse you want to be on. The folk, the guy who, the company that gives a good fight but loses, you do not want to be with the company that gave a good fight but lost because they lost. And if you think in mid-race you're on the wrong horse, change horses. Find the right horse and jump up onto it. So, a couple of ways to do it. So, that is the, I, I, do, I do what I call classic pure price momentum, and I'll touch on that in a second. But broadly in mind, broader investment. I have a death to us part portfolio. And what drives the thinking behind the death to us part? What are those mega trends? What are the companies benefiting it from it? How do I hop on that bus and then I stick with it? ShopRite to me is one of them. So I hold ShopRite at 210 Rand. And there are 140. I still hold them. Why? Because there's no chance I'm going to time the exit at the top and time the re-entry at the bottom. It's a case of this company is a future of food retail in Africa. And in fact, it's starting to get attractive. I'm starting to say, hey, I think I might be wanting to buy some more. Not just yet. Another 10% down, then we get interested. So broadly, it's permeating everything I do. Capitec, I bought for the simple reason when I interviewed uh, uh, the CEO and now his name has completely vanished from my head. Rian Stassen, thank you. Um, and it was just, I mean, the way he spoke, he was so completely unbanker. And it was about that centralization. It was about the complete and absolute computerization of the process. It was about the fact that they say, where are my customers? Taxi ranks. Go put a bank at a taxi rank. Oh, you know what? My customers are there at 6 o'clock in the morning. Brilliant. Open the bank at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm old enough to remember Wednesday afternoons. Bankers went open on Wednesday afternoon. I don't know where they went. Actually, I do know where they went. They were out playing with the doctors, because doctors also didn't work Wednesday afternoons. You know, and they open on Saturday from like 9.30 to 9.34. Yeah. No, no, you're the customer. Come on, what's this nonsense? Be where I am, when I am there. So that's the much broader. That to me, the mega trends is the investing angle. Pure price is the out and out trading angle. In other words, you just do a search and you say, what are the bigger movers? What are the stocks that have got momentum? So how do you know what stocks have got momentum? Well, go do a scan of price return of the last 12 months. Take the top 40 index. Go scan all stocks in that top 40 index and find those that have done best and buy them. Because you know what? Those trends tend to continue. They tend to continue to play out. And that's not the picture I wanted, neither is that one. That's the picture I wanted. So that is a pure price-based momentum portfolio. The mid-cap's new, so it only ran 2013. This is a cash portfolio, real money. And uh, this year, that's the wrong way around. This year, we lost. So my index did 15.5, and that one did 21. But Last year, 45 and a half versus a 28%. 28% or 26 and a bit is a solidly chunky return. And that's just saying, so what do you do? Take the stocks from the top 40 and say over a predetermined period, and you could do it over the last month, what are the ones that did best? Buy them and hold them for that period.
So index is, is, is mid cap is my fund, index is the benchmark. In that case, the index is the mid cap index. Top 40, those 21 and 15 and a half are the wrong way around. So my benchmark did 11.4, mid cap index. The stocks that I took for momentum did 42. Risks. Where's my risk screen? Particularly if you're doing pure price-based momentum, it's high risk. Why do I call momentum high risk? Because classic sense says higher reward, higher risk. I think spotting the right mega trend and getting on the right bus for that mega trend, you can mitigate risk. If you're doing pure price-based, yes. Market turns are going to hurt. When you are in ShopRite, which is the high flyer in the retail space, when retail turns, ShopRite's going to turn hard. But you know what? When it turns back up, what's going to happen? ShopRite's going to run hard again. And they're going to make the most profits, and they're going to give me the fattest dividends. Sector rotation. Sector rotation, yes, no, maybe. I mean, the conventional wisdom says at some point, people are going to get tired of buying in the indie stocks, and they're going to start buying the financial and the resis. And when that happens, it will hurt the indies. It will. All it's going to do is for a period of time, which will probably be measured in years, the return will not be as stellar as it has been in previous years. But they're still going to increase their profits. They're going to increase their dividends. And if anything, they're going to give you a second chance to buy to that investment. If you're pure, if you are pure price-based, sector rotation does hurt. And costs, particularly if you're doing pure price-based, in other words, you're doing a lot of transaction. When I'm talking about the pure prices, that strategy there, find the top stocks and trade it. And if we go back to that chart right at the beginning of the presentation, the problem with that chart is they rebalanced every single month. But they didn't take costs into account. Major flaw. I, 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 so the, 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 the other flip is they exclude dividends. So in essence, you could say, well, dividends probably offset costs, perhaps, maybe. But if you're doing short term, and that's why my momentum trading strategy, when I'm trading, as distinct from investing, I'm doing long, I'm doing 12 month momentum trading. So end of this, end of February, I will go and scan my stocks. I will find the winners. I will buy the five best ones in the top 40. I will buy the six best ones in the mid cap, and I will hold them for 12 months. My risk there is sector rotation and cost. Part of that cost is transaction. Other part of that cost is tax. Um, this is just a quick slide I grabbed. I want to touch on it very quickly. And again, it's saying to you, yeah, momentum is giving you the return, but it's giving you that return at higher risk levels. We can park that. We can park that. One of the things about momentum, people say it's the new fad. No, man, momentum has been around since forever. I mean, the tulip bubbles, that, that's 500 years ago. You know what? There was momentum 500 years before that and 500 years before that. It's always been around. What you'll find is things suddenly become popular and, and, and hyped about, which is exactly the point I'm making. So now suddenly we have a momentum ETF from ABSA. We have a momentum new trust from uh, Satrix. It will always be there. Sometimes it will be flavor of the month. Other times, flavor of the month will be value investing or, or, or bearish, or whatever. There will always be a flavor of the month somewhere. Just because it's not flavor of the month, it doesn't mean it isn't there. You've got great return. You can see volatility, particularly if you're doing pure price-based. The key point continues longer than you ever think. Yeah, if you buy a share... And your friend says, why did you buy it? And you say, because it's going to go up tenfold. They would just call you crazy. But in truth, it can absolutely happen. And it happens all the time in our market. It doesn't happen quickly. It happens slowly. You know, it takes 10 years. But tenfold, 10 years, I'm young, I'm patient. <laughs> 